I came here with $167. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have seen many people come through here. She said, I've seen couples come here with hundreds and thousands of dollars and they didn't make it. So you're coming here, you don't got no man with you, and you come in with a hundred and some dollars. She said, you need to get, she said, as soon as you get here, you need to get back on the plane, you need to turn around. And I don't even, I didn't even know Senegal was a country. It was just like, you gotta go there. That was, it was just like something inside of me that was like, mm -hmm. you gotta go to Senegal and you have to do whatever you gotta do to get to Senegal. So I always say I got like the best of both worlds because in LA it was like super privileged. You know, I went to dance school and swim class and all that and then Oklahoma it was like cutthroat. Mm. Like a whole nother level. <laughs> well, tell me about that level then. <laughs> um, let's just say that I went from safety, <laughs> feeling safe to like Shootouts. My mom was fighting all the time. It was like, yeah, she was like, a, she was a certified. She was a gangster. Like, what do you mean by it? she's a gangster? Like, she was a she was a crip gangster. So, really? Yeah. Like crip, crip. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. For real. Like my plan was to come to Senegal with like ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. By the time I got to New York, I probably had like eight. In my mind, I'm like, oh shit. Like I've been having this dream to come here for all these years. I'm finally here, and we're in a shelter. The flights have been canceled. What the hell did I do? You know, once you announce to your family that you're moving to Africa, you gotta get to Africa. <laughs> like you can't, you know, they already are against it. So you, 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 it can't be like I told you so, you know? Africa is the only way out. It's the golden and it's the holy grail for your freedom. Like if Americans, African-Americans specifically don't see that investing in Africa changes everything for you, I mean, all the way down to generational wealth. Like it's in the, Africa's in a position where if um, African Americans take position now, you guys, every single African American in America would be a millionaire. We're not even thinking twice because there's not, there's nothing that's not needed over there. Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode and this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we interview people who decided to leave the diaspora, being the US, UK, other Caribbean countries and currently living here on the continent of Africa. And uh, today we are in Senegal, you know, it used to be Ghana, but now we are in Senegal. And I do have here someone very special. This lady decided to leave the U.S. and uh, to move to Africa and no country than Senegal. So I'm here in Senegal to have a conversation uh, with her to, you know, dive into her story a little bit, go back to the U.S. And uh, so without further ado, Deila, yes. right? Yes. Welcome on the show. <laughs> yes, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I left Ghana just to come to Senegal I for know. you to, to get your... I know. Thank you so much. I feel special. <laughs> I feel so special. People are watching you for the first time. They yeah. might not know who you are. You do have a YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. I do. But uh, can you briefly introduce yourself to the people watching you for the first time? Hello, everybody. My name is De La Soul, and I am a painless birth worker. That means that I train women on how to give birth without pain. I'm also a YouTube content creator. I'm a professional dancer, and I'm a quantum healer and manifesting coach. Mm. So that means that, <laughs> I know you're like, hmm. Quantum um, healer. Yes, quantum healer. What, so that means that, that um, I, I show people how to go on a certain brain wave and to pull out any kind of like diseases they have in the body, mm -hmm. um, any disalignments, trauma, stuff like that. And oh, I also wow. coach them on how to manifest their realities if they want. I like that. And mm -hmm. the first question, why Senegal? <laughs> um, honestly, I don't know. I was just I was just told to come here. Like mentally. Really? <laughs> yeah. You, Literally. Elaborate on that. What do you mean by that? I mean like, um, like I had the feeling that I wanted to leave America mm -hmm. uh, back in like 2013. 2012, 2013, mm -hmm. and then um, I just started researching, like, okay, I want to go to Africa. I looked up different countries. I wanted something completely foreign, and I don't even, I didn't even know Senegal was a country. It was just like, you got to go there. That was, it was just like something inside of me that was like, mm -hmm. you got to go to Senegal, and you have to do whatever you got to do to get to Senegal. I it like sounds that. so crazy. Yeah, now before we get into that, right, <laughs> how long have you been in Senegal now? I've been here for three years. Three years? Mm -hmm. Wow. I know. Wow. Let's go back a little bit to the U.S., mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why did even Africa became an option? Let's go to the beginning of your story, okay. everything. Mm -hmm. How did all this come about? The idea of Africa, yeah. um, even considering Africa, mm -hmm. Senegal, how did that come about? What made you want to leave U.S. so badly? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't know. I think it probably started when I was a kid. My father was a traveler, mm -hmm. so he's been everywhere, and he would come and come back and bring me gifts. I think my obsession with leaving started then, mm -hmm. and then it was just like around 2012, 2013, all the stuff happening in America. Like that's that's around the time when they started doing like the police killings and putting it on. I mean, they've been doing it, but it was like put on the screen for us. Mm -hmm. So I think with all of that um, and just just helping me awaken to like this place, this is a crazy place to live if you think about it. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what sparked it. I was just like, I want, I want more freedom. I want more peace. I want to feel safer to, you know, have my kids outside. I want to not feel like I have to, you know, look behind the corners everywhere and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. yeah. Well, where, where were you in the U.S.? I was in a few places. I was in L.A. Mm -hmm. I lived in Oklahoma, Atlanta, and a little bit in Chicago. In Chicago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, Growing up is very important, right? Like yeah. your beginning of your story. How, where did you grow up in the U.S.? So I grew up between L.A. and Oklahoma. Really? Mm -hmm. At a, what age? Um, so my father raised me for the first 11 years of my life in mm -hmm. L.A. Mm -hmm. And then my mother was in Oklahoma. Okay. So my, my first experience of traveling, like I always tell my mom and dad, they're like, I can't believe you packed up and, you know, you want to leave. I'm like, y'all train me for this. Because from, since the time I was like maybe... Five or six, I've been on the plane by myself. Mm. Just Five, six years mm -hmm. old? Mm -hmm. Do minors really travel like that? Yeah, really? back then, I don't know what they're doing now, but back then they had the escort. Oh, okay. Like the person that works at mm -hmm. the airport and then they would help me. Now, okay, what was your upbringing like, you know, mm -hmm. by growing, being raised by your father? Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly tell us what it is like? Yeah. Know? So with my father, it was amazing. He um, he was a music producer. Mm -hmm. So I grew up around a lot of celebrities. I grew up in the studio, that LA, you know, life, lots of art. And then after I turned 11, I went with my mom in Oklahoma. So I always say I got like the best of both worlds because in LA, it was like super privileged. You know, I went to dance school and swim class and all that and then Oklahoma it was like cutthroat hmm. like a whole nother level <laughs> well tell me about that level <laughs> um let's just say that I went from safety <laughs> feeling safe to like shootouts my mom was fighting all the time it was like yeah she was like a, she was a certified she was a gangster <laughs> really yeah and, and then, I would like to get into that you know? <laughs> it's kind of crazy <laughs> yeah tell me about it like what do you mean by it? she's a gangster like she was a she was a crip gangster so really? yeah like crip crip yes like yeah. for real <laughs> yeah tell me about it like so it growing up around like, that environment I mean I felt like it for the for the first 11 years, I didn't mm -hmm. really know her that well because I would come in just to visit. Mm -hmm. And then it was after that, it was just really shocking for me because that was the total opposite of what I was used to. Like, she would just, like, it would be a normal day. She'd just be fighting somebody or come in the house. It would be a whole different thing. We have to get down, somebody's shooting. So I ended up getting used to that mm -hmm. after a while. That's from was, 11 years to what age? Yeah, I was, I was like 10, 11 when I moved to Oklahoma. And I left um, LA. So when did you leave your mom to be alone by yourself? Um, I was what, 17, 18? Okay. Mm -hmm. We had moved to Atlanta. I graduated in Oklahoma and we had moved to Atlanta. And mm -hmm. then that year is the year that I left. Okay. Well, the next year, I guess. Okay, then. How did life begin when you left your family now you're on your own? Mm -hmm. How did it so walk me through that? You were living alone, you were mm -hmm. living with a family member. What was it yeah. like? Yeah, so I was living with a boyfriend at the time. I had got pregnant. Um, I was pregnant at 17, so I graduated from high school and then I moved to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I started my modeling career. I got pregnant that same year and then, um, yeah, like in the middle of my pregnancy is whenever I left and mm -hmm. I went to stay with my boyfriend at the time. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Why did you leave in the middle of a pregnancy while staying with your mom? Um, was she being condescending or what? what is it? There were some differences that we had, yeah. Do you mind speaking <laughs> about that? And it was just that time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was it was just differences, you know, sometimes like, you know, sometimes you don't have the healthiest relationships, you know, with your mom or, or your mom, you know, mothers don't always have the healthiest relationship with their kids. So today it's total opposite. But I think at that time it was it was just time for mm -hmm. me to go off and do you my don't mind me asking, what were some of the things that made you want to um, just leave to just leave that behind and um, be on, on your own? 
or even ghosted with your boyfriend at that time? Yeah, I think it was just, I think, I, I don't know. I guess it was just the arguing and the just differences. You know, she's going through her own thing and stressed out, money, you know, issues. She's going back and forth from Atlanta to Oklahoma. So it was kind of like that. And then my boyfriend didn't live with us. So it was kind of like more convenient, you mm -hmm. know, for me to just go, mm -hmm. being that I was mm -hmm. turning 18 too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now, um, fast forward, you were living with your boyfriend uh -huh. and then uh, walk me through, because one of the things that I saw in your YouTube channel is, I saw the title moving to Africa, I think, uh -huh. with, my, with my four kids, if uh -huh. I'm not mistaken. Yes. Now, I want to be able to put some things in perspective okay. to the point where, you know, you have your first child mm -hmm. to the point now you have four. Yeah. And then... I think one of the stories that I saw on your YouTube channel is, I don't know, you don't get me, correct me if I'm wrong, mm. but be almost being homeless in New York or something with yes. your kids. Yeah. Your four kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. I saw that on your YouTube channel. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I want uh, us to really address that a little bit from having what, your, your first child, uh -huh, my first child to the mm -hmm. point where, you know, that became a scenario for you and then right. having to, you know, leave. And then I realized that you wanted to come to Africa. You put that story out, but it goes to a point where I think you said that you, you can't afford to come anymore and the people donated money to you mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yes. Walk me through the whole process. Okay. So, I mean, I was super young. I was pregnant at 17. I had him at 18. Um, for a, a year, I'll say, I think it was for almost a year I was single. Um, no, I take that back. I haven't, I wasn't single for a year. I'm, I'm going to say that it took me about a year before I met with my ex-husband. And so with my ex-husband, we had two kids. We did that whole marriage thing that was 10 years. Um, I bought my house in Oklahoma. We moved to LA. Um, back from LA, we went to Oklahoma. And then that's whenever we split. And then from there, I moved to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So that's where I had my fourth child in Atlanta. And then um, pretty much even throughout the journey from, from LA, it, I knew, like at least maybe six, five or six years into my marriage, I was like, I don't know why, but we gotta go to Senegal. Mm. So that had been my, like whatever it was just inside of me, my intuition, we can call it God, you know, Yah source. But um, it was definitely something really strong that was just like, whatever you do, you have to get to Senegal. Mm. And you have to get there before a certain time frame. What was the time frame? It was um, about 10 years. Mm. Yeah, like a little bit before. So mm. actually, I gave myself 10 years to get here, and then I, I made it in eight. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's a whole thing, because even me being like, I gotta go now, it was like, okay, I, I don't What was it so to. difficult that you couldn't leave so, so fast? So, honestly, I think that I think that I just didn't know that I could have just left a long time ago. You know, I think that when it's so new, like back then there were no videos on moving to Senegal. There were barely any vloggers, you know, as far as Americans coming here. So I think like when I look back, I'm like, okay, I could have like, especially for what I went through coming here, I could have just did this a long time ago. But yeah, I think I was overwhelmed and I thought, you know, I got to do this and have this together and have this and then ended up finding out I, I could have did this already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what were you doing for work between that mm -hmm. period from, I think you said, um, um, probably let's start after your, you said you, div you were married for 10 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you divorced, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what did you, were you doing, working during that marriage? Oh uh, Yeah. For the beginning of, the, of my marriage, I was working, I was working corporate jobs, like working in call centers. And I got so tired of that. Like, I mm. felt like I didn't really know my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, my first two kids were in daycare. I, you know, I barely seen them 12 15 hour shifts. And then um, I just really started to set up, like before I knew that I wanted to leave the country, I started to really set up my life to be able to um, homeschool the kids. I wanted to stay at home, homeschool them, and I wanted to I wanted to be able to really raise them. I felt like, it, mm -hmm. like I don't really know you if I gotta be at work all day and then I barely get a, you know, a break. When I do get a break, you're at school, you know. So yeah, mm -hmm. and so I ended up, I'm gonna say like 2013 is when I um, worked my last job that was in LA. And I was just like, I'm done with this. Like, I don't care what it takes. Well, what I'm job was that? Say it again. What job was that in LA? It was the same thing, like cost okay. of the work. Okay. Yeah. So then I was just, I told my ex-husband, we were staying in this huge house with my father. And I was just like, look, y'all got this like I'm gonna stay home and I'm gonna work on me I felt like I, I know that I knew that I was supposed to be an entrepreneur I just didn't know what 
I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there's no way that I can focus on raising my kids the way I want to, going to work and whatever my, all these gifts and passions that I have inside of me. Mm -hmm. So I really set it up. Like um, my ex-husband went to aeronautics school. He was working for Elon Musk at um, SpaceX. And I was just like, look, I need you to do this and do this and let's make this happen so we could travel and then we can do that, you know. And so it ended up happening perfectly. Mm -hmm. I was able to stay at home for a little while and focus on my craft um, that year. The same year that I knew I wanted to come here is when I started dapping in like different business ventures and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then like the next year I was like, OK, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done with this marriage. <laughs> which, which was 2019 or 2020? That was 20. Say it again. When did you decide to leave finally? To leave here? Mm -hmm. US. To come here? Um, when I decided, mm -hmm. that was 2013. No, no. But when I actually came, yeah, yeah, that was 20, technically it was 2019. Mm -hmm. It was like the end of 2019, right before they announced, um, like a few months before they announced the COVID. Now, mind you, I had two more years because I was like, I'm giving myself 10 years, right? And then I woke up one morning and I was just like, I gotta go now. Like, I'm supposed to go right now. So um, there was a woman like so. So my whole journey, like those last seven to eight years, I have been really public mm -hmm. about my dream of moving to Senegal. Like my kids grew up with drawing pictures of Senegal. Like there, there was this whole obsession I had with Senegal. And then um, so with throughout all of that, I met a, a girl. Uh, me and her were friends on through social media, and um, I, like we met through Facebook. And uh, she reached out to me in 2019 and she was like hey i know how you feel about moving to senegal she's like i just went there she speaks like six different languages she's from gabon but she lives in new york so she's well traveled and um she was like uh, i know how you feel about senegal um i just left i'm gonna marry this guy and so we should all make this move together like since you're already you know trying to be on your way let's just do it together so i'm like okay cool and then that year we planned on coming in like 2021, but I was like, I have to go now. I don't know what just happened in my sleep, but I have to go now. So she's like, I haven't even finished school. I'm like, that's cool. You can stay, but I have to go. And so I ended up booking the tickets three months later and she ended up booking them too. With me. So what happened to the point where you, you almost didn't make it to Africa? <sighs> yeah, so that. <laughs> so what happened was the girl the girl was not who I thought she was. And I have to, I have to be honest because I'm, I'm accountable, right? No one set me up to be friends with her. This was a friendship that I formed through social media, which we know is sketchy, right? That can be sketchy. Um, but we, we really did have a real connection. She helped me throughout my divorce. You know, we kind of um, bonded on certain things and um, the plan was for us to leave in September of 2020 mm -hmm. and for me to for me and the kids to travel from Oklahoma to New York. And we were going to stay in her house for like a week and then go off. But, you know, this is the middle of. So um, or I don't know if I should say that this is the middle of the pandemic. And so um, and so with that happening, they had canceled our flight. And so I'm in the girl's house for like maybe on the fourth day and out the blue, she just tells me that her landlord said that we can't stay there anymore and that she has to take us to a shelter. Hmm. So I never been in the shelter before and this was not the plan. Hmm. So um, I want to say I came there like my plan was to come to Senegal with like $10,000. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to New York, I probably had like eight. And um, so, you know, it's chipping away, you know, the more you stay in an expensive place, it's chipping away every day. So I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? Like, do I go back to Atlanta? Do I go back where I have some family, but it's not really stable for me to stay there? I'm like, no, this is the closest I've ever been to getting here. So I have to stay here. So I let her take us to the shelter. She's like, oh, it's a nice shelter. You know, you do have to share, you know, the space or whatever, but it's not like that. So we go and the shelter was crazy. It was nice. She mm -hmm. was right. Um, but it was like I have four kids. So it's a lot of us. And then we are sharing this house with other women, different energies, attitudes, you know, like 
Um, being that it was in the middle of everything, they had to like check your temperature before you go in and out. There was a really strict curfew. Uh, we're vegan, so it was crazy. Like you couldn't cook in the house. So I ended up just like, um, there were some girls that were like, you should not be here. They were like in New York, apparently, in New York, if you don't have a place to stay and you have children, then they automatically have to set you up. Like if you have a certain income you know, bracket, then they have to set you up um, in a home, in an apartment. Mm. So that's what happened. We ended up going to the apartment um, and the girl ended up blocking me and she ended up, she ended up blocking me. She ended up doing this whole smear campaign thing. She was on live, like she was like calling my exes. She was calling my mom. She was reaching out to my aunts. It was crazy. Saying what? Let's get, let's get into that. So she was just like, um, she was, what, what was she saying to them? She was making up stuff. Like when, when I wanted, because we didn't know what happened. Even her husband, her husband is here in Senegal, right? So she drops me off at the shelter. So I'm in my mind, I'm like, oh shit. Like I've been having this dream to come here for all these years. I'm finally here and we're in a shelter. The flights have been canceled. What the hell did I do? You know, I've, I've, I've you know, once you announce to your family that you're moving to Africa, you got to get to Africa. <laughs> like you can't, you know, they already are against it. So you, you, you it can't be like I told you so, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? So being that she just flipped everything, I'm like, what the hell? She ended up blocking me, which I mentioned. Um, she ended up blocking me and she had, I still had two of my passports mm -hmm. that needed to come to her house. So when she blocked me and I had a suitcase there too. So I ended up calling her husband like, look, I don't know what's up with your wife, but she dropped us off at a shelter saying this and that. And here we are. So he calls her like, what's going on? She's like, oh, you know, we had disagreements. I didn't know. I don't know anything about what's going on. So I'm talking to her mom, me and her mom are conversing and she's just like, I don't know what's happening, but my daughter is just saying that, you know, she tried to help you. It just, it just ended up being a totally different thing. Mm. So when she was reaching out to my exes, she was telling them that I was running off with the kids to Africa. She was, um, she was telling my, my parents, I don't even know what she was saying to my brother. But she was just like, you know, Dela is, is trying to run off and she hasn't been, you know, a good friend. And she was like, she said something about um, how something about her daughter tried to touch me and I moved her hand. The most pettiest shit in the world. Mm. Just like out the blue shit. Mm. <laughs> wow. And this is the, someone who reached out to help you, right? This is someone who I wouldn't say she reached out to help. I say that. Me and her were friends because we were good friends mm -hmm. over the phone. I'd never met her. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. I never met this girl in person. Mm -hmm. So that's why I gave that disclaimer mm -hmm. because this isn't something you would normally do. You wouldn't normally, you know, say I'm going to move off to a new country with someone that technically you've only known over the phone for like, I'm going to say we were friends for like four or five years, mm -hmm. but we had not met. So mm -hmm. when I went to New York with the kids, that's, that's the first time of us meeting. Wow. Yeah. Now, how did you get yourself? Though? So now you are in the apartment with your kids. Mm -hmm. um, what year was it? What month was it? How so, long did you stay there? Yeah, right. this was 2020. And I'm not going to lie. I was a little naive because I just couldn't imagine a woman doing this, knowing my children, knowing me, the bond that we had, even though I know I get it. We didn't know each other in person, but it's still it's still a thing like people. A lot of people watching this will be able to say that they have connected with people via telephone or the Internet and they had a real connection. I have women that I know personally now that I've met and we've connected on the Internet and it wasn't weird, you know. So going from there to there, I was just like, wow like i was shocked and there were some people i met from my platform from my instagram page that were like there were some new yorkers like there was this one guy in particular he's like yo like shorty she lying like there ain't no landlord this is in the middle of covid she's making this whole thing up and so um going forward with us going through the shelter the ladies are telling me that you should go into this home in because we were in um manhattan i think and so we ended up going to the Bronx because that's where they were giving the apartments. And so um, there is that's when that's when I was like, OK, my life is a movie because <laughs> I ended up getting a text message one day. I still don't know who this person is. 
it's either it was either her nanny or her mother because her mother was in contact with me her mother was like i'm so sorry she's like i don't know what to say we don't know what the problem is she just told me that you guys had differences and that you had to leave so whatever story she ended up telling on the internet or whatever it wasn't what she was telling to her husband and her mm -hmm. mom you know so um someone texted me and they were like um, I'm not going to say her name, but they were like, so-and-so doesn't want you to get to Senegal. Really? She, yes. <laughs> they were like, um, you don't know me, but I know you. And they were like, um, when you when you get to Senegal, um, I'm going to reveal who I am. Mm. But she does not want you to go to Senegal. The person said, we're tired of her doing her friends like this, and we want to see her get her karma. Mm. This was the text message I received. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. I'm like, wait, who are you? The reason why I say it had to be her nanny or her mom is because the person was trying to help me. Like mm -hmm. they were like having me contact this particular person and that person and whoever they were, they were with her. Mm -hmm. So I don't know to this wow. day. They never reached out to me again. And when wow. I moved here, I tried to message them like, hey, like I'm here. Like, who mm -hmm. are you? And it was um, a text down number that wasn't active. Mm, so we don't know who that person is. I have is. no idea, but they're watching me like... <laughs> Interesting. Isn't why why do you think she didn't want you to come to Africa? Um, I don't know, honestly. I think that... I think, honestly, I think that she's seen more potential in who I was going to end up being here than I did. Mm. That's my best answer. Mm. Because my vision of coming here was like... In my mind and the intuitive message that I got about coming here was like, you got to come here and you got to build your village. You got to help people get here. Mm. So that was what I was focused on. I had already done YouTube. YouTube had already been a, a dream of mine. So I started, you know, five years ago, but I wasn't thinking about doing YouTube here. I wasn't thinking about dancing here and being in videos and doing all this. This is what the girl used to tell me that I would be doing here. Mm. So she would be like, when you get there, people are going to love you. They're going to love your personality. You're going to be on YouTube, da, 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 da. So when I look back on it, you know, sometimes, like, you might know that you're it, but sometimes other people can see more than you can. Mm. So honestly, that's all I can come up with. <laughs> wow. Now, let, let's, you, how long did you stay in the shelter, the apartment? Um, we were there for almost four months. Four months. Yeah. And then later you left the apartment, got to your flight here. to hit, and mm -hmm. then moved to Africa, mm -hmm. Senegal. Yes. What was that day like when you were moving with your four kids to Africa? So that day was really, really crazy. Um, I mean, the whole thing, even going from Manhattan to the Bronx was like the hardest day of my life. Like what? even what, just what, traveling. What, 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 um, so it rained that morning. It was pouring down raining. I didn't have a car. So I had to figure out how to rent like one of those little vehicles that you can rent real fast, like just mm -hmm. for a few hours. Mm -hmm. I ended up using that. Um, it was hella expensive, like from Manhattan to the Bronx. It was like $100. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to go back and forth because I had to be approved to get out of that shelter and then to go into another shelter. And mm -hmm. then I had to go back to get our stuff. So that whole day, like, I'm not going to lie. That day, you know, my baby was, at that time he was two. So he had a diaper rash coming on because we've been moving all around. I text the husband and I was like, look, every time I see your wife, I'm getting her because mm. this is crazy. Mm. Like what I'm going through with my kids is crazy. That's how I felt at the time. I don't feel that way no more, but I definitely was like... You wanted to pull up on her. Hell yes. <laughs> I'm like, girl, what the hell? Like, we were supposed to do this. You know, our conversations was like us, you know, two black women coming with our kids. She has two kids coming with our children to Africa. We're going to be doing this and doing this together. And they have a company, or at least they had a company, um, bringing people here. So they wanted me to be the face of their company. What happened? Did you guys have arguments before this girl no. told you to leave? No argument. It was the weirdest thing. So mm -hmm. that day, the day that she texted me and told me that we had to leave, um, the kids and I were out. So we went to Brooklyn that day just to sightsee. And so on the way back, she texts me and she's like, my landlord said that um, it's too many people in the house and you guys can't stay. So I have to take you to the shelter. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, how much time do we have? She's like, you have to leave tomorrow. Mm. So it's like, uh, we had to, we were late on the train that night. So it was like a good 10, maybe 11 o'clock when mm. we got back to her 
apartment. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, you're telling me that in less than 24 hours, I need to figure out where I'm going to go. With your four kids. With my four children in four suitcases, okay? Because mm -hmm. we are ready to move to Africa. So we have big ass suitcases. So the thing, the way that I knew that things were weird is because I'm thinking like, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going front. I was a little naive, right? I'm thinking that she's telling the truth. I'm thinking that because sometimes in, in the States you have like a capacity of how many people can be in your apartment. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, this is the middle of the COVID. That's kind of weird. You said it was fine for us to stay. We didn't, we had this plan for months, but okay, whatever. So I'm like, when I get back to her apartment, she's going to help me figure out where to go because mm. this is her city and obviously we're friends I don't know where to go she knows that um I don't really like I wasn't really good with I mean I never traveled outside the country so even when I bought my ticket I got you know gave the money to her and then we bought she purchased the tickets all together so I'm just like okay like you know let's figure this out and she's just like <laughs> no communication she stayed in her room all night so I'm like, okay, you know, women know this is weird. Something's weird, something's mm -hmm. off. So um, she just took us to the shelter the next day. She didn't say much. I mean, she still acted pretty helpful with helping me get in the shelter. Like they had to like call her phone and verify some stuff. She did that. And um, I just know that I was in a state of mind of like, okay, this is adventure time, apparently. Mm -hmm. Like uh, this is not what I planned at all and it's lit. So I didn't really like the next day, I wasn't really able to focus on her. Like I was focused on where I'm going to feed the kids and how am I going to come up with this money? Because with with uh, Portugal Air canceling the flights, you know, the money is there and it's really going to be coming on to her card because that's where I that's how I booked it. And so um, I think it was I think it was the next morning after that. So we mm -hmm. stayed our whole day in the shelter. The next morning after that, she texts me. She sends me this long ass fucking like Harry Potter book text message. And she's like picking all these little things. You didn't do this and you did that and you did that. And I can't believe that you spent the whole day there and you haven't texted me. Mm. I'm like, is she serious right now? Like mm -hmm. I'm in a shelter right now with my children. I don't I cannot focus on checking on you like if anything you should be checking on me right now you know like you're in your apartment you got someone that's paying for your kids tickets you know and so um it just went from there it just spiraled from there my focus still like i'm thinking in my head when she texts me that and then she blocked me i'm like okay i have two passports that still have to come to her house i have um a suitcase because we were going to do like a it's called Jepe here, but it's like where you put it in a box and you send it. So that's what she was supposed to handle for me. So I'm thinking about my stuff. So I reach out to her mom and her husband and I'm like, look, I don't know what is going on, but she has my things and I need my things. Like I need for her to bring them. So her husband and her mom were so confused. They were like, we don't, we don't know either. She hasn't said nothing to us, but we're going to make sure, you know, that you get your stuff. So on to the next you know she's doing whatever she's doing that's when she was making the phone calls well that's when she kind of started because really when we got to the bronx is when she really was like next level but um so that's when the women tell me that i need to go to new york city and they are going to give me an apartment hmm. um that's the day i said i still say to this day that was the hardest day i had in my life hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah it was so hard like I remember waking up that morning because I had this whole plan, like I'm going to get up because of the the laws there when you're getting assistance, like you have to do things the way they say and they're very strict about it. So they were like, you cannot check out of this shelter without um, or you can't check in a shelter without checking out of this one. Mm. But then you have to get approved to go to that one. And this is their hours, you know, or an hour away. So that morning I woke up, it was pouring down raining. There was no way I could go outside. And I just remember just laying in the bed and just crying. Like, I was just like, what the hell? Like, mm -hmm. what is my reality right now? I started to question. I mean, we have eight years now of me being like, we're going to Senegal. This is where we're going. I'm like, am I crazy? Like, did I make the biggest mistake of my life? Like, this was my thought process. And then it's just like, you. after you go through all those emotions, okay, we have to go forward. So um, the, the caseworker there, she ended up putting me on to how to get a rental car, uh, like one of the little daily ones. And um, I ended up doing that. It was very expensive. 
And um, yeah, me and the kids, we walked in the rain. We went um, once the rain slowed down. And that's the thing too, you have to make it there at a certain time frame. And when you're doing like, cause I had to ride a few buses to get to the car. Mm. So when you're doing the public transportation, you know, there's more time and they were like, you need to make it here by eight because they have to find your apartment. They have to approve you. You have to wait all this shit, right? So um, we finally make it to the Bronx and the caseworker had told me, don't worry about taking your paperwork because mm -hmm. you already gave us all your paperwork mm -hmm. and it's in the file. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, they were like, no, we don't see anything. There's no paperwork. So I filled out all this stuff. We're waiting all these hours and then they're just like, where's your stuff? And I'm like, the lady, she told me not that I didn't have to bring it because you guys already have it. So um, yeah, we ended up having to go back. The caseworker understood because I was like, you know, you told me not to bring nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yada. And uh, she was like, no, that's okay. Even though they were not supposed to let me stay another night, she was like, you guys can stay another night and then you can go back to New York, back to the, the Bronx and, mm -hmm. um, and get it done. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. We went mm -hmm. the next morning and stayed there the whole day and they ended up approving me. Mm -hmm. to the get same it. day to get up. Yeah, the same day. That was the whole thing. Was like if you go there early mm -hmm. enough, the same day they will put you in an apartment. Wow. Yeah. Now you stayed there for four months mm -hmm. and then left to Africa straight yes. up. Yes. Yes. Now let's speak on that. And now let's speak about Africa and you landing here and the face they okay. house and like Okay, um we might wanna we, you probably wanna back up. Okay. Because how I got here is crazy. Okay. <laughs> so tell me about it. Yes. Okay. So, you know, the, the tickets were, um, the tickets were about four, I'm going to say like 4,000 when I first booked them. By the time the, the end of the year came around, you know, Portugal Air canceled the flights. The flights were booked through her. And so, um, I didn't have the money. Like I, you know, my money is being chipped away. And then, um, I didn't, by the time we got to towards the end of those three and a half months, I didn't have it all to pay and so um and another thing is that the girl told me and mind you i've never been anywhere so i don't know um how to how this works when you're moving to a new country mm -hmm. and so she had actually told me that um i have to book a round trip because if i come there mm -hmm. and they see that i have a one way they're going to turn me around mm. so i didn't know until later that i never had to pay double what mm -hmm. i was what i ended up paying mm -hmm. but um yeah, it was definitely one of those things where um, I was on the phone with my friend one day and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to come up with this money. Mm -hmm. And he was like, look, you have been teaching the world for free for so long. He's like, everybody learns so much from you. Um, we're all so inspired. Why don't you just ask your audience? Mm -hmm. He's like, just ask your audience and just see what they say. So I'm like, you're right. Like everybody knew that this, that I wanted to come here, you know, to Senegal. So maybe they're, they'll be on board with just helping me. So I ended up uh, posting a picture of the passports and explaining to everyone that I was on my way without mentioning her. Like, I feel like that's an important piece to this because although she was in my face, calling my family and all that, I never focused on her. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. Because you got to have tunnel vision to do this. So if I had even barely, slightly, besides that text message, <laughs> if I had done any more than that, I don't think I would have made it here. Mm. So I, I really was tunnel visioned. And um, I think that's why I ended up making it here. You know, my, my audience was like, oh, my God, like you were almost there. So even when I told the story about uh, how come I needed the money, I never mentioned her. I mentioned mm. Portugal Air canceling the flights and now we're stuck in New York and they ended up sending me five thousand dollars that helped me to pay for our tickets here. Wow. Amazing, right? And you almost missed the flight. Oh, yes, we almost missed the flight what because you? during that time, you know, it's the pandemic time. You have to have your test before you can board and um, the New York Department of whatever, they never sent it. Hmm. Till this day, we didn't we didn't get it. Wow! But somehow you got to. <sighs> yeah, <Wow. laughs> I, en I ended up getting um, test results forty five minutes mm -hmm. before our plane took off. Wow! So when I say like, I mean, when when people ask me like how like what do you think it was? How do you think you made it? And this is going to sound extra, but what I was doing the most out of this this whole journey was 
visualizing me being here mm. like even when we got into our apartment in the Bronx and I felt overwhelmed you know that was a thing because even though we were in that um, house shared with women it was air conditioning there and everything was already set up this apartment in the Bronx was they like you on your own like you know we gonna give you the apartment and they left you with some pots and pans and you doing your own thing no air conditioning no wi-fi so i was just like oh my god like what have i done the kids was like mama it's hot and we ain't got no wi-fi you know i'm mm -hmm. like what did i do should i have stayed there should i have you know i'm questioning all of this stuff mm -hmm. and what i just kept doing was visualizing myself being here mm -hmm. and i mean that to the the actual thing that I'm saying. Like I would go on YouTube, there was a YouTuber that would do videos in Senegal and he wouldn't do any audio. Mm -hmm. He would just do music and he would go through the streets of Senegal. So when I say I would sit down with my tablet and I would watch the videos and I would literally imagine that we were here. I would see me and the kids, I'm like, oh, okay, we're over there in the corner. Okay, we're walking down the street. That is like, I, I don't know. Like I have this whole thing. I'm like, I locked it in. Mm -hmm. I feel like I locked it in. Like once you once you really set your mind on something and you do it to the point that you can feel it, like nobody could have told me anything different. I was just like, I don't know how, where, when, but I know that I'm getting to Senegal. Mm -hmm. Now, and so, yeah. when you visualize everything, that uh -huh. came where you arrived at the airport yeah. to Senegal, look out the flight window, even before you touch down. Yeah, so well, even even at the airport, it was crazy because, you know, I have all of these years that I'm telling my kids we're moving to Senegal and then we get to, to New York and we're stuck there. So I didn't want to tell them anymore. So my kids did not know that we were moving to Africa until the day we moved to Africa mm. because I didn't want to have them thinking that we're going and then something else. It was just too many crazy things happening. So um, we went to the hotel. We went to the... Um, airport hotel in New York so that we could you know go off and um, I had to have my oldest son help me with the baggages I wanted to make sure that the the weight was right I didn't want any other craziness you know so he came with me and I tried to keep it on the low I told them that because they just always know that we're just we're getting to Africa one day right mm -hmm. and so I'm like what we're gonna do I'm like we're gonna go to the airport and just see what the like the bags are good so that one day you know soon in the next couple of weeks or so we'll be able to get there mm -hmm. that, that's what I told them I know that mm -hmm. sounds silly mm -hmm. but I just I couldn't tell them that and then something else happened so we go there and then um, we check the we do the bag thing and um, and then the the um, TSA or whatever, the guy ended up saying something to me. He asked me something about the flight. And then I turned around and my oldest son was crying. Mm. And I was like, I was like, hey, Shylin, I'm like, what are you, why are you crying? He's like, did that guy say Senegal? I was like, yes. He was like, are we moving to Senegal? I'm like, yeah, we're moving to Senegal. Oh. And I'm like, um, I asked him why, mm -hmm. why he was crying. And he was like, because I don't know what's going to happen to us. Mm. And so we just stood in the airport. We just held each other and we just cried. And I just assured him, I was just like, I don't know what's going to happen exactly, but I do know that this is what we're supposed to do. Mm. I do know that as crazy as this journey has been, and don't get it wrong, mm -hmm. because if you look back even on my Facebook you couldn't tell that I was going through, like, we had the time of our life in New York. I met some of the my favorite dancers. We went sightseeing. You know, I made the best of a crazy situation, but it was still crazy, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that moment because we just stood there and held each other. And I feel like in that moment, it was like... It was like I was going off of what I knew inside of me. You know, sometimes you just know something. Like, nobody can tell you anything different. And everyone who knows me for those last eight years knew. Like, this girl, you cannot stop her. She's, mm -hmm. you know, she's going to Senegal. And it was like, in that moment, I was just like, damn, like, I got to really make sure that this is happening. Like, you know, like, I don't know. Like, I already knew that. But it was just like hearing your child say, like, I believe in you, mama, but shit is kind of crazy. You know, like this ain't really been what you said it was going to be. So if I felt a lot of pressure. I felt a lot of pressure. And I was just like, we're going to, this is, this is happening. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But it happened. It, it happened. Ha you felt like when you go to Senegal, mm -hmm. 
how do you feel like when you walked um, outside and, and, and felt the environment and yeah the, it was it was amazing like just just getting honestly getting on the plane i'm like we safe like we made it you know so um getting here it definitely was the same kind of energy and i was just like damn like everything it felt like the the feeling that i had about the girl it was just like like you you were just a part of my journey like mm. if it wasn't if it wasn't for you then this wouldn't be my journey mm. because honestly like you know I, like i said i was very public about moving to senegal and in my mind i thought i would always be coming here by myself and then i meet this girl and she's like let's do this together this wasn't even my thing to do this with someone else mm. so throughout our time of us planning to come here i noticed that she wanted a lot of control mm. over me. Like she wouldn't give me any websites for me to, you know, I had already paid for my apartment and our appliances before we moved here. I paid it through her. Mm. So I sent her husband the money to get the appliances and stuff. I'm like, I want a, a stainless steel stove. She's like, no, you can't get that. She's like, th th these are your options, you know? So getting here, I just felt like, dang, like I get it. Like I understand now. I understand why this had to be like this because I wasn't supposed to do this journey with anybody else. This was supposed to be my my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who picked you up for the airport? That was crazy too. <laughs> so, um, oh my God, like from the airport. All right, let's, let's go back to the very first year that I knew I wanted to move to Senegal, 2013, right? Mm -hmm. I'm on... Facebook, I'm finding all these people that are con that are connected to Senegal. And um, I find this lady and I'm like, hey, I know you don't know me, but I'm planning on coming to Senegal in 10 years. Watch, like, make sure you know my name because in 10 years, I'm going to reach out to you, but I'm going to tell you, like, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a ride from you. So I ended up reaching out to the lady in eight years. And so there's a lady, she she's in the States, but she goes back and forth. And, and let me say this too. This is, this is why, another reason why I wanted to tell my story because there's a lot of people involved that claim that they are helping us come here. Mm. And that's not really the case. Like the, like the girl, the, her and her husband, they had, they had a whole company to help people come here. And then they were just not genuine at all. They don't, I, I don't think the company is existing anymore. Um, the chick, she is going back and forth. She's helping people. And, and I shouldn't say, okay, she's an elder. She's, this is a older lady, right? And so um, I ended up booking my, I, I didn't pay for it yet, but I had set it up for me to get the ride, right? And so another very important piece to this is that I came here with $167. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Yes. <laughs> from, wait, $8,000? Mm -hmm. How did you go from $8,000 to having 100 and what? 167 living in New York City. <laughs> wow. Yes. Living in New York City for four months, almost four months. And the eight thousand dollars you've saved for your lifetime? No, 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 no. It was just I mean, I just came up with that real quick, like, okay, we gotta go, let's get out of here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I also say too, because a lot of people they hit me up and they're like, I wanna move there, but I, I need five years. And that's why I like to tell my story because I could have made it here ten years ago. Mm -hmm. But I thought that I needed all this set up and I'm not you know, suggesting that people don't come here without money because that mm -hmm. wasn't my plan. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like my story was to show that you can do all the planning you want. Mm -hmm. It ain't never going to go like you ever heard the saying, like, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. That's <laughs> that's what my story is. Mm -hmm. So I definitely made it here with 167. And the lady, um, she canceled my ride because when we were in Togo on our way here, you know, we had to stop in Togo mm -hmm. and I called her and I was like, hey, you know, I'm just letting you know that I'm in Togo and mm -hmm. that, you know, we're almost there in Senegal. And she's like, OK, um, you know, how much money did you say you were coming with? She's been doing this for like 30 years. And I go, well, um, I only have one hundred and sixty seven dollars. Mm. And um, OK, wait, let me back up. I called her when, when we were in New York. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I and then I explained to her how much I had. So then I called her when we were in Togo to tell her we're almost there. And she goes, um, I'm sorry, but I canceled your ride. Hmm. And I'm like, why would you do that? Like our plane is landing at 10 o'clock at night. My kids are going to be tired and hungry. Why did you cancel my ride? She's like, look, 
I have seen many people come through here. She said, I've seen couples come here with hundreds and thousands of dollars and they didn't make it. So you're coming here. You don't got no man with you and you come in with a hundred and some dollars. She said, you need to get, she said, as soon as you get here, you need to get back on the plane. You need to turn around. Hmm. And I'm like, I'm on the plane. Like it's about to take off. So my signal is about to go out and I'm telling her like, I can't turn around. Like there's no turning around. Like this is it. Like this, I'm in Togo. Like she's like, no, I don't care. I don't care. She's like, if, if you know what's best for you and those babies, you need to turn around. Hmm. Yes. Wow. So, so she cancels the ride. We get to Senegal. Um, I didn't know that they have issues with the, the ATM sometimes. Like sometimes there's no money in it. And so when we got here, I tried to take money off the ATM and I couldn't. And so the exchange guy is super late. I think we might've been the only flight that came in at the time. And then the exchange guy doesn't speak English. So he calls the owner of the place that he works and the owner speaks English. And so I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm trying to get this money off. I'm trying to get a ride to our Airbnb. And um, the owner was just like, hey, like, I'm just going to come get you. He's like, where, like, first he kind of asked me, like, what are you doing here? Like, where, like, do you have a husband? Like, what is going on? I'm like, no, I'm like, no, I'm just supposed to be here. I'm just doing my thing. Like, <laughs> I know, it, you know, it's so funny because the first year of me coming here, people were just like, what you said why like you know and it's just like i know i'm supposed to be here i can't explain it like mm -hmm. you know so he ended up coming and um picking us up and taking us to the airbnb wow it's a total stranger and it's it's, it's three years <laughs> into it now yes three years into it um music videos later paid commercials later youtube popping later just everything wow yeah. How, how, how has it been living in Senegal as a single mother yeah. with four children? It's been really amazing. Mm -hmm. It's been really amazing. Senegal is, you know, their whole thing is Taranga. They're all about hospitality and welcome. So I feel like, um, I feel like if I would start in any country, it would, like Senegal was the best country for me as a single mom mm. because of the help that I receive here. People mm. are really their hospitality is like A1. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, from from the exchange guy, you know, mm -hmm. he never did anything harmful. He showed me into our Airbnb. He took us to get food. And then he was like, call me if you need me, you know? And then from there, it was just like a ripple effect of me meeting all these people that have just helped me. Now, let me let me just dive in because I love diving into stories. Okay. Dive One, $146. $60. Yeah. Yeah, $167. $167. <laughs> After the amounts that you've paid for Airbnb and the days that you've paid for Airbnb, when that day was over, what, what happened next? So yeah, I didn't know how I was going to pay for our Airbnb next. And I was really big because we had already did the Bronx thing. Mm -hmm. um, I just did not want to come to Africa and be in the slums. So I was like, I don't care how much. I definitely could have got an Airbnb for like... $30 a night and no, we were staying in like $60, $70 a night and we stayed in the Airbnbs for a month every single day or I'll say sometimes every two and three days. I had no idea how I was going to pay the next day and it happened. <laughs> wow. I, I <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I think I feel like my story is the true story of, of faith. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and when people hear it sometimes, I always get mixed answers because it's like, okay, yes, that's what it is. And some people get so robotic about like, well, you have to plan, everything has to be planned. But not everybody's story is like that. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is journey, everybody's journey is like that. Here we are on the 10th year of me planning to come here and we're doing this interview and I'm perfectly fine and my business is doing what it's doing, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm making my money and doing my thing. So not everybody's journey is supposed to be where Everything is like structured and planned. Sometimes it, you got to get a little crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. you will you, will you advise someone in your situation, uh, what's in your situation to make a move like you did? Um, no. No? No. I wouldn't because not all of us have like 
the mental capacity to do the work that I did. Mm -hmm. Like I was very consistent with my mind. Like you have to have a tunnel vision mind and you have to be focused on your vision. When shit goes left, you can't be like, oh, well, you know, most of the time within the first month or two, like we have so many plans that we plan that we make up and then we end up doing something else. Mm. So I definitely wouldn't advise for people to come through this way if they Mm. don't plan on really like tunnel visioning, doing the work, clear the chatter in your mind, pray, meditate, whatever your thing is, but get your mind right before you. (laughs) Wow. Now, let me ask, did you, did you, when you touched down for the first year, did you one month into it, two mm-hmm. months into it, three months into it, what did you do? Did you find a job to mm-hmm. kind of, you know, tell me about it? Yeah, so um, I was already making some pretty good money doing essential oils um, before before New York. And mm-hmm. then I couldn't really focus on it that much. So my money started kind of going down. Um, by the time I got here, I kind of just went with that and then, I'm, and then the practice that I have now. So, I mean, I was still doing that then, just more. So um, doing my coaching, my, my birth coaching and stuff like that. And then I just kind of made a way that way from all my little. Yeah. Now, even though you fell out a little bit with your mom in the mm. early stages when you were pregnant for the first time, yeah. um, did she reach out during your moving, even mm-hmm. your parents, your dad as well, your family members? What did they actually, did they reach out? Yeah. If yes, what did they ask you about? What were their yeah. concerns and stuff like that? Yeah, so my parents did not agree with this move. They were like, you're crazy. This is irresponsible. Um, They were just like, you can't just go to an African country, yada, yada, yada. And um, my dad, who was very supportive, he's very like, you know, out there, dude, you know, even he was like, I'm scared, you know, he's Mm. like, you're not going to make it. And um, so we actually fell out right before I came here. I fell out with both of my parents. And um, my dad did reach out to me by the time I got here, like within that month, he contacted me and he was just like, all right, like, you know, it's been it's been enough months. We haven't spoken. Um, My mom, her and I didn't talk for the first year that I was here. Hmm. So that entire first year, we had not one contact besides when the girl reached out to her. We had to talk about that. And Hmm. then that was it. But um, no, we, we didn't talk at all. And what's funny is that. My father did not want to leave America at that time. He lives in Tokyo now, and my mom is trying to move here or somewhere. She's trying to get out of America. Mm, so really? It, yeah, it's kind of cool because it's like they needed me so to you, take you that first step. So you inspired your parents to Definitely. move. Definitely, yeah. I like that. Now, you did mention that you, you, this lady who tried to help you in the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, you stayed at her apartment, but later on kicked you out. Mm-hmm. How did that end, though? Because I remember you saying... Do you see her? What 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 is it? What happened between that? Um. So yeah, it just it just went from her uh, going on live, and I don't even know her whole thing. Um, it was really weird because it's like you're responding, you're responding to nobody because I'm not saying anything. So it was like a thing where, and her husband, her husband did end up telling me later that she was, that she felt a certain way about me coming here and meeting him and stuff. I don't know how true that was, but um, no, we, we never spoke. Um, about three months of me being here, I ended up taking them to court mm. and cause you know, they have money of mine. I sent the husband about $800 for my appliances. Uh, the husband was just like, when I got here and tried to get my money, he was like, you not getting it. Mm. Like they were shocked that I even made it here. And uh, he was actually trying to get me to go to the Gambia. He was like, did you need any help? Like, I know you only speak English. Do you need help to, mm-hmm. for me to get you to the Gambia? I'm like, no, I'm here and I'm staying here. Like, where is my money? And um, he was just like, we don't know what happened with the appliance. You know, all these excuses. So that was $800 there. And then the girl had the four, almost five something um, from, the, from the plane tickets. $5,000? Yeah, it was like four, four mm-hmm. something. Because... Um, Yes, four thousand. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, Portugal Air ended up crediting the money back to her card, so that was crazy too. Even for me, because I had been the only contact that her and I had, which it would be like in, in New York City, it would be like me texting, like, "When are you going to give me the money?" And she would say, "I don't have your money." Some something, and then she would like block me. Like she would message me out the blue, and then she would block me every time. So I could get no closure. I couldn't ask her what really mm-hmm. happened, anything like that. And she just kept telling me that they did not. Uh, they, that they never gave her the money. So how did I end up? 
I ended up finding someone online, someone on Facebook who um, lived in Portugal. It was a it was a Gambian dude that lived in in Portugal, and he ended up going to the airport there and getting the information that yes, they did credit it back. So that way, I couldn't go off of what she was saying. And so about three months in us being here, now mind you, I had given up on getting the money back because honestly, it was too much stress with her. Like it was too much. I felt like I needed to heal from that whole situation. I don't, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't even know what just happened. And um, I just said, forget it. I don't even want to go back and forth. The la When I called the husband and asked him for the money and he was like, you're not getting it. I was like, you know what? I know y'all have all my money. Just keep my money. Mm -hmm. Like what's going to happen is what's supposed to happen to y'all. Like I got to focus, you know, I got to get to the next, you know, how I'm going to get in the apartment, all that stuff. And so I ended up giving up on getting the money back. And then I met someone that helped me get into from our Airbnb to our apartment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he has like a, a big name in, in Senegal. And um, he, I don't even know how, like he asked me something. We ended up talking about it. I mentioned them very briefly and he was like, oh, like they got your money. I'm like, yeah, but don't, <laughs> we, we ain't even gonna open that back up. He was like, no, 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 we're gonna get your money back. I'm like, please, no. Like I want, I don't want the money, you know? He's like, no, I'm gonna call. He's like the husband of Senegalese, right? I'm gonna call him, I'm gonna let him know who I am and we're gonna get this done. So he insisted that he call the husband and tell the husband his last name is like um, Gaia or Gaia here. And it's like a popular, it's like a, one of their, um, like a Muslim prophets. Mm -hmm. He was like the great grand, he's the great grandfather of him. Mm -hmm. So when he called and told him his name, everything changed. And I, I think that for a little bit, they thought he was playing still. Like they kind of was like, you know, is this real? Is this? So we ended up going to the courthouse. One thing I love about Senegal, like what I ended up doing with the courts and winning my money back, it would have never happened in America. Like mm -hmm. I would have had to hire a lawyer. It probably would have took a year or longer. We took them to court within that within those three months. Um, I ended up going to court and getting my money back. I probably waited. I think I waited about two months mm -hmm. and then they had to show up. Um, it was really crazy because when they showed up to court, Okay, first of all, they didn't show up. Mm -hmm. The husband showed up. Mm. The husband showed up saying that the wife had moved back to New York. Mm -hmm. And mind you, it's been five, well, it's been like seven months now, right? And I'm so tired of the lying and the reversing. Like she's on live telling people that what she was doing to me, like calling my family, she was on live saying that I was calling her family. Like really, like hella crazy like I felt like I was like in a a lifetime movie or like a Tyler Perry movie or something you know <laughs> so um I was really really tired of that and so when the husband was like she moved back to New York I'm like uh-uh I'm like she's lying she's lying I'm telling the guy she's lying I'm so tired of this and the investigator is like don't worry he's like calm down don't worry so within 45 minutes they found her here Mm. She was here in another in another city in Senegal, mm. and they were like, um, "So if you don't show up to court tomorrow, then we're gonna come get you." Mm. And so she ended up having to come. Um, this was a huge day for me. I had a lot of anxiety because you gotta remember, like, even though it sounds crazy, I really connected with this girl. Like, she helped me through so many things. I helped her. I thought we had a real, you know, connection. And then she ended up doing all that. And then I, I have to face her. So, um, and then we're in this, this room is like the smallest little, it wasn't a courthouse. It was like a bathroom size. Okay. So we're in this little room and, um, and I'm standing over her because it's so mm -hmm. small that and they just had a baby. So the, the investigator, you know, let her sit down with her husband, me and the guy that's representing me is standing up and I'm just staring at her the whole time like this. Like I'm looking at her in her eyes because I'm an eye person. Like I want you to, I want you to feel me through the eyes, you know, like I'm not going to say anything, but I want you to feel me. So I'm staring at her the whole time. When I say this girl did not look at me one time, like, you know, I'm the only person that speaks English in the room, like only English. So she's having to speak to the guy that's translating for me and the investigator. He's on one side. He's on one side. She's not even looking at me at all. 
And um, long story short, they tried to lie and say that they didn't have all the money. So the investigator was like, okay, if you guys don't have all the money, you guys decide which one of you guys will sit in jail. And then when you guys have the rest of the money, you can. When I say they left, they went to the ATM, came right back. With mm. the money. Wow. Yeah, they ended up doing all the little transfers that were necessary. But I ended up getting all the money back. Wow, I think that also helped out with the <laughs> when you leave in here. For then, sure. Okay. Yeah, that definitely helped out for wow. sure. That's a story. It, it was crazy. Welcome, it was amazing. Welcome home, though. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Now you've been doing great. I see you do great on your Instagram, yeah. dancing, you know, music videos like you mentioned. Also yeah. your YouTube channel. It, it's been amazing. Would you say that mm. um, this journey has been worth it for you? For sure. Mm. For certain. Like I have a, a completely different perspective or maybe I won't say completely different but I mean in the beginning I definitely felt some kind of way um about how it happened how it went down um for a little bit I was scared because I'm like there's a woman that is crazy about me and I don't really understand it but she speaks all these different languages and I'm out here with my English American self you know like so I definitely went through that and um and yeah, so now it's, I'm, I'm not, now I'm just like, yeah, this, this was worth it. Like, this is actually an amazing story. Mm -hmm. And um, opposite of what I felt before, I feel grateful. If I seen her today, I would say thank you, mm -hmm. honestly, because you made my life lit. Like, I, I got a story now. You know, my life was kind of boring before. Like, <laughs> I was just kind of momming every day. So now it's, it's on a whole other level. Mm -hmm. well, what advice would you give to people watching you right now? Um, people that want to move here? Yeah. I would say, um, I would say like, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. That is the biggest thing. Um, when I figured out that I wanted to move here back in 2013, there is a guy, he's an elder that teaches on uh, melanin in history. His name is Dr. Kaba Kamane Hayawaka. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the audience has seen any uh, Hidden Colors films, he's in those films. He's a really good friend of mine. And when they uh, killed Mike Brown and all that stuff was going on with Trayvon Martin, I reached out to him and I asked him, like, you know, how do you focus on your personal mission when you got all this going on? Like, how have you been doing this? All You know, he's an elder. So it's like, you've been seeing this for all these years. And the words he gave me was, keep your eyes on the prize. Mm. And so I think that throughout my journey, throughout the entire thing from New York, from the night she told me that we had to go and everything else that morning, going to New York City, um, I was, it, it was those words in the back of me, like keep my eyes on the prize. Mm. So I feel like Americans, we wanna, a lot of us wanna come here and then um, whatever type of surprises happen, I personally haven't met anyone whose plan just went as it you know as they thought it would go so what happens a lot is we end up veering off mm. so it's just not you have to keep your eyes on the prize give three best advices to Ooh, people who are okay to... um besides keep your eyes on the prize yeah um in preparation to move into africa yeah let me see um do your research off of off of like the main internet like i feel like people go to google and do their research and you really got to go to like these youtubers that have a, that are really sharing their real life though not not going off of the youtubers that are just always having a good time and everything is so light go off of the people that are really sharing the good and the bad mm. i would definitely say that um what yeah. else i would say i think americans specifically need to know that living in africa is like it's like living on Mars. Like this is like, <laughs> this is a different planet. I don't think that Africa is like any other place in the world. Mm. So I think that a lot of people, especially depending on your background, you know, in America, we have these certain cities, like there's some in LA, there's some in Atlanta and New York, and we might wear our daishikis with our locks and we might be like black power, you know? And I think that we do a lot of our history. And so we feel like, oh yeah, we know Africa. People come here just like that. Like, oh, it's, oh, the, the heat is not going to be much. Oh, the, you know, and I just think that you got to really know that you have to be realistic. This really is something that you don't know shit about. Mm. Don't try to act like you know. Don't try to act like you have any idea. One thing I'm really grateful for about my journey is that I didn't know anybody. 
So even though that's crazy, my my coming in here was so raw and so like I didn't have I didn't have any time to research any YouTubers or do and you know that wasn't in my mind when I first came when I first wanted to come anyway. So I didn't think to do that. I didn't have any like preconceived this or that. It's like let go of all that and just come in here open, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice. last thing I think it would be, um, I think people focus a lot on the material things that they need here, mm. the different plugins, if they need a fan, you know, what kind of like, and I think those are the least important things. If they need to bring tissue, I think that. I think that there is, it's a mental thing. Like for, I can only speak for Americans and the people that I've helped, you know, come in here. And we have this thing where uh, we have a lot of healing to do. Mm. So we come here with a lot of baggage, mm -hmm. with a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we could do a whole other episode on the trauma that I already knew I had from living in America and the traumas that come out in me mm -hmm. from me living in America here. You we know? do an episode on that. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, there's so many paranoias mm -hmm. and all types of things that mm -hmm. I think that if, if you're in America and you're aware of it already, that's great. Mm -hmm. But when you come here, that shit comes out like it comes mm -hmm. out in different ways and you're like whoa like I got a lot of work to do so I think that um, just coming here knowing that you you have I don't want to say humble but you need to come here knowing that you do have a lot of work to do as an mm -hmm. American we have a lot of healing that we have to do mm -hmm. and when you when you come here it's like in America we are familiar wherever you come from even if it's the UK you're familiar with that place and who you are every day, the way you get in your car so independently and you go and do your stuff on your own, that's who you are every day. But when you move to a place like Mars, no, when you move to a place like Africa, <laughs> um, all that is shed. And especially a place like this where you don't speak the language, you are no longer who you thought that you were. Everything is broken down and you're no longer in that independent position. So it's like we come from a capitalist place where it's like, I, I need to have this like this and all those things start coming out. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, healing that we have to focus on wow. when we come here. I like that. Now, I know I would, it would not be right if I don't ask this question. Right. How did, how well do your kids, mm -hmm. you know, fit into the society and how did they respond? Were they, yeah. you know, to, to Africa the first time at the beginning of the journey? Mm -hmm in the middle of it and to this day? Man, it, this is the most important question. <laughs> because honestly, like, just telling my kids all those years that this is gonna happen, going through the journey and questioning if this even makes sense, and then being able to say like, yeah, like I was right, you know? Like mama was right, you know? Um, it is everything for me. It's everything because I don't even know how I knew. Like I used to tell my kids, my oldest is 15 now. Mm. When he was five, I was telling them that when we moved to Senegal, people are going to see them. Like adults will actually notice them. Mm. My, my personal opinion is that we don't notice kids. We mm. don't pay attention to them in America. Mm. We're more so, our culture is more like go in the, go in the room. Don't, don't speak unless you're spoken to. You know, in Africa, you know, you guys are like have a party like with the kids. You know, mm -hmm. like it's all like a family thing. So um, I don't even know how I knew that, but I knew that that they would be seen and that and that they would and that they would be safe. Mm -hmm. So um, and I asked my kids all the time. I have a, a video of our anniversary last year and we actually visited here in Sally and I asked them I, I let them elaborate on um, on how they feel. And they were just like they feel safer and more independent. You know, they can go to the stores by themselves. Um, my my youngest plays soccer now. You know, football is not a thing. You know, it's not a big thing for us in America. So he's doing his thing, and um, yeah, I, they they love it. Wow. Now, why 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 did you leave? Because you told me I think behind cameras that you were living in Dakar, but left Dakar to yeah. Sally. Why uh -huh. did you leave Dakar? So I love Dakar. Dakar is my it's, that's that's my my first you know stepping ground. Yeah. Um, but Dakar is like literally identical to New York City, mm. which which also I feel like was such a divine thing for me because I, I ended up getting stuck in New York City. So it wasn't so much of a culture shock, mm. you know, going from like I call Dakar Africa's New York City with mm. all the taxis and the busyness. You'll see. And, um, and so it's nothing against Dakar, but it was a lot of the combustion, a lot of the um, the air pollution, um, traffic, the busyness. 
I just wanted to, I felt like I came right in here and I got my connections that I needed and I, you know, I did my, my little work and I was just like, okay, I want to go to Sally and I just want to rest a little and mm. just kind of, you know, focus on my writing and mm. other things I want to do. So, yeah. I like that. If you do have a final message to people watching, what would that mm -hmm. message be? Ooh, um, I, I really want people to know that there is this thing that's happening right now, right? I don't, don't want to get too deep, but there's this thing that's happening in America mm -hmm. and in other places, other Western places. And a lot of us are feeling it on the inside that we do not belong where we are. And I want to encourage people to take that feeling that you feel and to turn it into action that you really do every single day like why don't you have your passports if you know that you don't want to live where you are as I, I mean I know for us Americans that's a specific thing like why don't you have your passports make the move make it happen because what you're feeling on the inside is real and there really are things I know we think that for the last two years stuff is over but it's not over it's, mm. it's coming back so um, that was the purpose of me moving here. You know, even though I was 10 years ahead of, or eight years ahead of the whole thing, a lot of us feel that inside and we're just kind of like, is it really, is it really happening? It's happening. I'm letting y'all know it's happening, okay? So gear up, get ready, put your armor on and get your ass over here. <laughs> That's my message. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me and sharing your story. And uh, you do have a YouTube channel, which mm -hmm. you're doing amazing things on there. Thank you. But uh, for people watching who don't know where your YouTube channel is, can you share the name with them? Yes. My YouTube channel is De La Soul. So that's D-A-I-L-A-H and Soul. Like like the group, if, you are, if you're not from the 90s. You know, if you're an 80s baby and up, then yeah, you know De La Soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of content do they, should they expect to see? Um, I do a lot of vlogs and I also have a podcast called Earth is School. So I just talk about all things that I'm passionate about. Um, a lot of my healing work, a lot of my, my mental work that I do on the brain. Um, I also co-host a show called Repat No Cap. So mm. it's a live show. Um, we're ending our second season now, but you guys can still go back and look at all those videos. Now that is important because if you're trying to move here, we are giving, it's Repat No Cap. Mm -hmm. So we're giving you our experience, you know, with experience. no cap. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's that. And then, um, yeah, I just like to in inspire people. You know? How do people reach out to you? Because you do so many things. People want to reach out to you to yeah. help. Like you reach out to somebody back in the days when you wanted to move. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to reach out to you and stuff like that, they need your help, mm -hmm. advice. How do they get in contact with you? So they can um, hit me up on my, if not my YouTube channel, then my Instagram. So it's I am underscore Lala2. Let me say that again. I am underscore, it's L-A-L-H-2. Um, and then um, they can also email me. That might be the best way. So Dela at Woman Tree. Mm -hmm. My company is called Woman Tree. Mm -hmm. So that's like the womb. And then and tree. So womb a n and the word tree. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.